Vampire Survivors. What started as a small game created by a single developer called Ponkel quickly grew into one of the biggest indie success stories ever and it most certainly inspired me to keep working on my own game Tangerine Defenders. Wait, you don't know what Tangerine Defenders is? Well, it's just a game I'm working on. You can wishlist on Steam right here. Do it! Anyways, since my game will take a lot more time to develop, I thought I would challenge myself by making a simple game in C++ from scratch. And I thought that Vampire Survivors would be a good idea, because it's simple. Right? Right? Anyways, I started setting up a simple project by writing a main function and opening a window. Luckily, I already had the code for the window ready in my own engine. After that, I set up an OpenGL renderer with the help of a friend, TCAP1. Big rich the player. He was guiding me through the process of initialization and then drawing a quad to the screen, which totally did not take two hours to set up. Yeah. The biggest problem I had was matching the window coordinates to the device coordinates on the GPU over here. Additionally, OpenGL's device coordinates range from 1 to minus 1, meaning Y goes negative as it goes down. I actually didn't like that at all, so I tried flipping it around. Next, I worked on textures, so I could start adding sprites for enemies and heroes. I decided to go with a texture atlas because it's easy to implement and good for performance. Many engines use a texture atlas so that the renderer does not have to switch between textures when drawing different sprites. So I went ahead and created a 1K texture atlas and then defined a sprite to be an offset and a position into the atlas. I would then use that offset and the position inside the shader to determine the texture coordinates. To improve the workflow with textures, I added a way to reload them while the game is running. I achieved that by checking for the timestamp of when the texture was last changed. Encountering a new timestamp would unload the old texture and then reload the new one into the renderer, propagating the changes from the texture to the game. What I just described is texture hot reloading. And it's commonly used in game engines, and now in this one too. It's worth noting though that this method is not perfect. Sometimes on Windows the timestamp is not changed. I don't know why, but it's Windows. So who knows? Instead what you could do is watch the folder containing the file and then whenever that file changes, update the texture. After that was done, I set up a basic input and movement system so I could walk around in the scene. And then I started drawing my first hero. I was heavily inspired by Castlevania, so I went ahead and drew a muscular guy with a dark hoodie and Dragon Ball Z pants. Yeah, so basically a perfect clone. Right. Anyways, apart from the totally different design, our first character was done and could be loaded into the game. By the way, is it me? Or is this guy looking kinda thick? Idiot! Vampire Survivors keeps you on your toes by constantly spawning enemies that follow the hero. But just letting the enemies follow the hero is easy. The real problem begins when you have to start worrying about enemies colliding with each other. My first approach was to give a circular collider to each enemy and then check all the other enemies for collisions. If a collision happens, I would push both enemies away from each other. Simple enough and works great. But this approach is very inefficient. Shaking for collision on every other enemy slows down the game dramatically because the cost of the algorithm is exponential to the number of enemies on screen. Okay, there's actually an easy way to fix this, but first I needed a break from the problem and so I started working on damaging enemies and applying knockback. Antonio is one of the first characters you get and his main ability, the whip, is actually one of my favorite abilities because you have to aim where you want to shoot. So there's skill involved and I like that. When it activates, it creates a slash that expands outwards, hitting every enemy along its path. For this I decided to create a box collider and have it expand together with the slash. And for every enemy that was hit, I would store the ID to not hit that enemy again. Collisions can be very easily detected by projecting the circle middle onto the box and then checking if that resulting point is inside the original circle. Next I have a quickie. <laughs> hey boys, boys, next I have a quickie for you, okay? I made an HP bar. It's very simple. Just a black quad and a red quad, okay? By this point, most of my functionality was in place, so I could add more sprites and abilities. But before I could do that, I wanted to get a color palette from low spec because I would then use that to draw the rest of the sprites and stick to it. Reason for that is, I'm shit at color theory. I mean, just look at this guy. 
He looks nice and clean. Why the other one? <laughs> what is that? After that, I started working on pickups. AKA the crystals that grant XP and let you level up. And um, uh, that is definitely not, not a yoink, okay? Then I added the new weapon, garlic. Very easy to implement, just deal damage around yourself. Not much to say, looks cool. Next was a big task, UI. For the text, I decided to use FreeType and then download myself a font of the internet. For example, this one. Nice. But before I could really go and start working on it, I had a big problem. Drawing menus is annoying because their size can vary and usually their background is just blank. And so instead of wasting a bunch of space in my texture atlas, instead what I would do is nine sliced rendering. Instead of drawing one quad, you draw nine, stretching the middle pieces, but not the corners. I mean, just look at this bad boy right here. 16 by 16 pixels. It doesn't get any better than this, bro. But even with this much power, making UI through code is still annoying. And the reason why is because you have to constantly close, compile and reopen the game just to see a single change. To help with this, game engines tend to use scripting languages because they're easy to program in and code changes can actually be reloaded while the game is running. And of course, we can do this in C++ too. Naturally. Essentially, the game code can be turned into a dynamically linked library, DLL for short. That library can then be loaded by the engine. And if you change any code in the game, you create a new DLL that you will then reload from the engine. And this is what I call hot code reloading, baby. Now, using this power, I was able to create most of the UI for the game, no problem. It's definitely not Unity or Unreal, I have to say, but it doesn't have to. For a simple C++ game, this is more than enough. Now it was finally time. I could add in a bunch more assets. So I started by adding in four more enemies, two new heroes, a mage and a knight, a couple of tiles for the grass later, and a magma ring. If you want to know what it does, you can play the game. Hmm? In Vampire Survivors, you can actually run into one direction without ever stopping, because the game is separated into chunks that repeat indefinitely. And each of these chunks should in theory be separated into texture tiles. So in order to rebuild this, I first thought I would create an array of tiles. Not the best idea, but the easiest to implement for me. And after that I would take the position of the player and locate him inside the chunk. So for example, if the player is at position 00, the origin, he would be inside the middle of the chunk. And then once the position was located inside the chunk, I would draw the tiles around the player. And whenever I hit an edge, I would reset the index to either start from the beginning or the end again, depending on which edge I reached. I should have probably used a view matrix, but I didn't. We can do that in the next game, I guess. Earlier we found out that it's possible to run it down mid lane without ever changing direction. And that's a problem because enemies could be left behind without ever being able to reach the player. A fix for this would be to check when an enemy is too far away and then have him spawn right in front or to the sides of the player. That way the enemies can never be outrun and eventually the player will have to face them or be surrounded and die. Earlier, we ran into a performance problem. Remember, the enemies would check for collision against all the neighbors, every other enemy. And that is bad. Instead, you can separate all the enemies into chunks based on their position on screen. And then an enemy would check for collisions against other enemies inside its own and all the surrounding chunks. Such an implementation is quite simple to do and I was surprised. The performance increased by about tenfold, which like blew my mind this simple change made the game so much more performant and we didn't do much. But it was great, which means the game has a lot more stuff we could add. So I decided to fill up the world a bit with some objects I drew and then these objects would be actual physical colliders in the world. The player will not be able to walk through these and will be blocked. The final goal of the game is to survive until the time is over and the final boss spawns. And then you can either kill the boss and win or die and still win. This can be achieved by having a list of boss spawns that will tell when and what type of boss will spawn. And then a win condition could be if the player has died and the last boss has spawned, aka there are no more bosses to spawn, or the last boss is actually dead. Past this point I mostly worked on small things because I thought the game was mostly done. I know I'm missing quite a few features, but here's a quick overview of what I did. 
I added a main menu, then I added audio using X-Audio 2, crystal merging. I also added an enemy collision detection, but it's kind of terrible. Just look at these guys. <laughs> you can't reach me boys, <laughs> you dummy. And then lastly, a victory screen. Obviously the game is not fully done and the most notable feature that is missing is meta progression. But I felt like past these about 48 hours, it was enough for me and uh, I wanted to move on to the next game. But if you want, you can actually work on the game because I've set up a GitHub page where you can download the source code and try it out for yourself. I've also added instructions on how to build it. And additionally, I've also added the source code onto HIO as well, if you want to have it there. Building instructions are included in the readme, please read it. And if you have any issues, just ask me on Discord or anywhere you can reach me on stream. I stream every day on Twitch. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, you should destroy that like button with your favorite weapon of choice. And then also, please tell me in the comments for what game you would like me to do next. I was thinking something like Celeste, but I would love to know what you think. Also, if you want to know how I made the game, if you want to see any tutorials, please let me know as well. Finally, I want to thank all my Patreon supporters. Mio Mio the Writer, Felix F and Magma Cube. You guys are awesome. Without you, I wouldn't be able to do these videos. Thank you very much for helping and supporting me. Anyways, until the next one, have a good one. Peace.